When did you serve in the, in the armed forces? Well, in the spring of 1944, I was a senior in high school here in Greenville. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I received a letter that said, greeting at the top. So I was drafted in the spring of 1944. And uh, I was sent to Erie for a physical exam mm -hmm. along with a number of other young men. Mm -hmm. And uh, after passing the physical exam, uh, we were lined up and uh, directed to a table above us, ahead of us. And it contained a lieutenant commander in the Navy and a major in the Army. And they were taking alternate one after the other with a big stamp. And as you put your papers in front of them, it was either Army, Navy, <laughs> Army, Navy. And as chance would have it, I got in the Navy by chance. And I was with a boyhood friend of mine after we were talking. And he wanted to be in the Navy so bad he could taste it. And I said, well, I really don't care that much. Let's go up and talk to the officers. Maybe they'll switch us. They wouldn't even listen to us. They said, get out of here. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I got in the Navy. <laughs> a few days later, we were directed. I was sent to uh, Sampson, New York, which was a uh, basic training boot camp for the mm -hmm. Navy. And that's located on, uh, on uh, Seneca Lake. This was in just before the invasion of Europe, you know, in spring of 19. Mm -hmm. This was in March that I went in. And uh, so they were pushing us through pretty fast. In those days, boot camp was typically about 12 days or 12 weeks time. Mm -hmm. But in my case and in my boot company, they pushed us through in seven weeks. Mm -hmm. So during the boot camp, of course, we were given tests of various kinds. And uh, one of the tests was testing your ability to understand Morse code. Mm -hmm. And I had studied Morse code in, the, in, the boot, in Boy Scouts, so I knew the code at least to some mm -hmm. degree. So I, apparently I got a pretty good mark on my uh, test there. Mm -hmm. So I was assigned to radio school right there at Samson, New York. Now this was a five month course. So a lot of my boot camp were sent to the amphibious forces that participated in the invasion of Europe. Mm -hmm. So in a way I was quite lucky to miss that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of five months of boot camp, I was sent to Norfolk, Virginia to the headquarters of the 5th Naval District where they had a major radio station. Mm -hmm. And myself and uh, two other buddies were sent as what we called strikers. Uh, we, had, we were seamen first class at this point. And we were assigned to the Naval radio station which, which is called NAM. Da 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 N A M <laughs> Norfolk. So <clears throat> we were set as strikers, and for the first three months, all we did is make coffee for everybody else. <laughs> it was a great duty, I'm telling you. <laughs> it was mostly all waves there, and they were mm. good. They were good operators. They knew their business. They were excellent operators. And I had a second class wave supervisor. She said, I'm going to make a radioman out of you or know why. <laughs> and she did, believe me, she was very good. So we, after about three months, we started standing watches. We would take seven to three, and then three to 11, and then 11 to seven for two, two tricks each one. For two days, you were seven to three, you would switch from there to 3 to 11, and from there to 11 to 7. So you never knew which way was up and down, you know. You were always sleepy all the time because you <laughs> never caught up on your sleep. Now but it was me, good training, it really was. Okay, when you say you were on, you said you were on watch? Yes, on radio watch. They had various circuits. Okay. And uh, one would be, for example, ship to shore circuit. Okay. And you would communicate with ships lying just off the Hampton Roads area mm -hmm. of Norfolk okay. there. 
So they would have radio traffic coming in or we would have traffic for them. This was all by hand now. We didn't have any automatic transmission. Nowadays they do. So you had to, by hand, copy all those on a typewriter, mm -hmm. the messages coming in, or send them going out by hand on a, mm -hmm. what we call a key. There you go. So, uh, and then there's what they call Fox broadcast too, which is, is beamed to all the ships in the Navy and all of the uh, uh, land bases in the Navy. And they have two transmitting points. One was in Washington, D.C., the other one in Honolulu. So those two transmitters had enough power to reach all the ships and land bases in the Navy from those two transmitters. Yeah, so we had to copy that all the time. Everything that came through had to be copied. And you took your turn mm -hmm. uh, copying Fox, as we called it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did my duty on that, too. About so the only thing that, go ahead. I was going to say, so you basically, uh, again, for someone who doesn't do it, it's kind of uh, yeah. hard to, to understand. Sure. But you basically hear it as a language. Yes, yes. So that you hear it and you know what's going on because you are so ingrained well, in it. Well, in wartime, it's, you're copying encoded groups of five letters. Oh, okay. It would be X, Y, T, M, B, or C, J, C, X, Y, you know, just one series of five coded letters after another, mm -hmm. which would be fed into a decoding machine. Mm -hmm. This is during the war. Mm -hmm. After the war, it was plain language, mm -hmm. plain English. But uh, one evening, I was sitting on a ship-to-shore circuit, and uh, about the only excitement I ever had in the Navy, all of a sudden I heard this loud message come through, da, 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 which is O in the Morse code, mm -hmm. which means urgent, super urgent. So I, he was trying to raise Charleston, South Carolina, and either the operator was asleep or whatever, mm -hmm. but I heard him. So I broke in on the circuit, and I said, I can forward your message to Charleston for you, if you wish. I sent a cue, what they call a cue signal, that says all that without copying it mm -hmm. out. So he came back, and he gave me a message in plain language. And it kind of threw me, because I was not used to copying plain language. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that they were being attacked by a submarine. You know, the, the German submarines were cruising up and down along the Atlantic shore, mm -hmm. and they were sinking a lot of uh, uh, ships along there. So anyway, I copied that quickly, and uh, I uh, called the, the uh, watch supervisor, who immediately sent it by landline teletop to, to Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Now, I never did hear whatever happened there. Mm -hmm. Presumably, they alerted the uh, aircraft or the ships down there mm -hmm. and probably went out to see what they could find. So after about uh, three or four months there, one of my buddies decided he'd like to go to sea. So he requested sea duty on the part of all of us. Against my will, I was very happy at Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> it was good duty. So anyway... Torpedoes don't get there. Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, we were all sent to a receiving station at Norfolk there, and we sat there for three or four weeks. Finally, our orders came through to be sent to the Azores, and you said you have been there. Yes. And uh, so we were put on a troop ship out of Norfolk and uh, transported to... Uh, Oran, North Africa, in Algeria, mm -hmm. which is where the British Navy, early in the war, had sunk the entire French fleet to prevent them from being mm. captured by the Germans, because mm -hmm. the Brits didn't want the Germans to have that additional uh, armament, you know. Yeah. Then from there, they put us on a uh, one of these 40 and 8 cars, you know, 
Oh, yeah. And the train, and we took a train across the desert to Port Laoti in West Africa. And from there, we stayed for about a week in Port Laoti. Mm -hmm. And from there, we were take, we're, we caught a, a B-24 to Lajan's Air Force Field in uh, Tessera, in the Azores. And uh, I was assigned to the radio station there in, uh, in the Azores. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, an air-to-sea, or a, a land-to-sea circuit, and one circuit that had it was what we call a split circuit. We had a toggle switch. And on the left ear, I had Bermuda, New York, and Argentia, Newfoundland on this ear. On this ear, I had Londonderry, North, North Ireland, Paris, and Port Laoti in Africa on the other. So I encompassed the entire North Atlantic <laughs> on those two ears. And you would sit there waiting for traffic to come through or to send. Mm -hmm. And you would hear somebody from Port Laoti, let's say, mm -hmm. coming in asking to you to take message. So you would throw the toggle switch so that you only had the one ear mm -hmm. going because if you got traffic mm -hmm. on the other, it would uh, confuse you. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> that was interesting, so having the entire North Atlantic on. Right, on in my your ear, head. yeah, in, your head. in my head, yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good thing. So, <laughs> so I spent one year almost to the day on Tessera, and that was a beautiful island, sort of semi-tropic. I spent one winter there, of course, and uh, it was good duty, really. Mm -hmm. And that uh, was a small base. We had a big RAF base there. It was all air sea rescue, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So one night I was sitting, uh, and it was very quiet, nothing much going on, and I heard Norfolk come on. That was on my ear too, Norfolk. And well, I knew all up? I knew all the waves in Norfolk, <laughs> <laughs> all the all the uh, the the waves at the radio station. Mm -hmm. So I sent did a da did da 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 did did. That is. What is your call sign? We each had a call sign, mm -hmm. usually just our initials. And she came back with, with telling me her call sign. I don't remember now what it was. But it turned out that I did know her. So I started to ask her questions with Morse code. What's so-and-so doing? And how are things in Norfolk? Blah, blah, blah. So this was during the war still now. The war was not over. Mm -hmm which was forbidden, strictly forbidden. Mm -hmm. oh, I believe. <laughs> so about two months later, it turned out that a monitor station up in Long Island was copying all this on the log. So the captain of our base got a notice that someone was doing unauthorized transmission. So they looked back in the log that we kept, you know, and sure enough, there was my initials on the log. So they had me right where it was short, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, I got a captain's mast out of that, which is a low-level disciplinary action. In the Army, we have an Article 15. Is that yeah. what it is? Probably, so it's a, probably, it's yeah. A, yeah. It's a small island, only about 9 by 16 yeah. miles. has two small towns. Mm -hmm. Angro do Eroismo is one, and Praia de Vitoria is the other. So I used to make liberties in those two towns. <clears throat> so I remember them well. But uh, after a year there, uh, well, the war was over, of course, and mm -hmm. the uh, point system came out. Mm -hmm. And eventually, yeah. since I was one of the youngest, I was 19, 20 years old during this time. Mm -hmm. I had very few points, so I was one of the last to leave the base. Mm. <laughs> so finally it was my turn to leave. And uh, I was given the opportunity to fly back on a B-24 by acting as the radio operator on board the ship because uh, uh, the, the pilot was short one radio man. So I got, got home about a week early because of that fortunate case that I was able to operate the ship or the mm -hmm. uh,
plain. A little bit of serendipity there. Yeah, serendipity, yeah. So anyway, I got back and we landed in New York. Or Well, first of all, we landed in Argentia, Newfoundland. And we were socked in there for about a week. So after about a week, I got a flight down to New York. And I had never been in New York, so that was very nice. In those days, the subway was a nickel, believe it or not. You could go in any place for a nickel. But uh, then I was sent from there to uh, Bainbridge, Maryland for discharge. And during the course of discharge, they gave us the pitch about joining the, uh, the inactive reserve, mm -hmm. which I thought, hey, this is, sounds good. You wouldn't be called up unless it was a war. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the early 50s, and then in the, in the late 40s, uh, things looked a little bleak with the Russians, you know. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, since I enjoyed being a radioman, I will sign up. So I did. And I never heard anything from them mm -hmm. for several years. In the meantime, when I got home, I went to Teal College and graduated with mm -hmm. a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And I got married and had two children. One day, a letter arrived. This was during the Korean War. We would like you to rejoin for a while. <laughs> so I was sent to... Uh, we, they would like you like you had no choice like, anyway. Like right? I had no choice, yeah. right? So I was sent to uh, Brooklyn, New York, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And uh, from there, I was sent to Newport, Rhode Island for a refresher school for about six, eight weeks. And uh, when I got back, I had my wife join me, and I was assigned to the USS Wasp, an aircraft carrier. Oh. It's a medium-sized carrier, not one of the super carriers, mm -hmm. but it's a big, good big ship. Yeah. We had uh, 3,000 people on board yeah. and 10 radio shacks. Imagine 50 radio men on that ship, just, just the radio crews, 50 men. See, that just astounds me. Yeah. I mean, uh, and you were all kept busy? I mean, it just... Well, not really. Not very busy. <laughs> <laughs> During general quarters, all ten were occupied. So we all had duty stations. And I was in Radio Central during that. I was, a, if I do say so myself, a pretty good operator. So they assigned me to Radio Central mm -hmm. for uh, during GQ. Mm -hmm. So we were sent then after, after commissioning. Incidentally, during the commissioning ceremony, the ship was being reconditioned and upgraded while I was at Brooklyn there mm -hmm. for several months. And uh, during the recommissioning ceremony, Eleanor Roosevelt and Bernard mm -hmm. Baruch came wow. aboard for the ceremony, and they both spoke. So it was interesting. Our, our commanding officer was Captain McCaffrey, B.T. McCaffrey. He was a, a very impressive guy. And his talk at the end of the ceremony was he welcomed us all aboard and he said, Men, the Wasp will be a taut ship and I will see that it is a taut ship. <laughs> that's not taunt, that's taut, T-A-U-T. Uh, tight. Tight. tight, yeah. yeah. And it was, it was a taut ship. But it was a good ship, and uh, we had uh, a good commander. So we took off from Brooklyn for uh, Guantanamo Bay for shakedown crews. And we spent the winter of 1951 and 2 at Guantanamo Bay. And we would have various exercises. There would be a, uh, a uh, recommissioning crew come aboard, and they would put us through exercises of various kinds. Incidentally, on the way down from Brooklyn, we were having exercises, too. And we lost two pilots during that period, two ensigns just out of uh, school. And uh, it's a very dangerous uh, thing. Landing on an aircraft carrier from way up in the air, and you're coming in to a tossing ship, mm -hmm. forward, side to side, and mm -hmm. forward and back. and you have with your hook, you have to catch one mm -hmm. of the cables that bring you to a halt. Mm -hmm. And it is dangerous. The squadrons would come and go. Okay. They would land and mm -hmm. be aboard for a while. 
<coughs> and then they would take off again, mm -hmm. and we would have very few people on board then, the ship's company at mm -hmm. this point. We were always glad to see the squadrons leave <coughs> because that, that meant the uh, chow lines were a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> so you ran for about a year for the Korean War. Yeah, right. Okay. <coughs> so then you got mainly, out. mainly just the shakedown crews. By the time I got back, my time was up. They were keeping people for 16 months who were recalled, but they had to let you go when your enlistment expired. <coughs> and my, mine expired after a year. So I got out about four months more ahead of the, the, the rest of the guys mm -hmm. who had been recalled. So then what did you do after you got out? Well, I got out. I went back to work in the family company. We have a foundry company here in Greenville. Oh, right. And uh, I went back to that yeah. and worked my Hard way foundry. up without benefit of nepotism. Mm -hmm. Finally became president. And uh, so then I retired from the foundry. So what do you feel like you got out of being in the, in the Navy? Some discipline. I think discipline was good. I, uh, when I went in, I was very much a immature kid. And uh, for the first six weeks or eight weeks, I was so homesick I could hardly stand it. But once I got into radio school and had something important to do, something to learn, yeah. then I enjoyed it from that time on. I really yeah. did. Because radio school was a good training. We learned to type, for example. Yeah. And we learned a little bit of technology, radio technology. Uh, well, I appreciate your talking with me. Well, it was fun. Uh,